People have been known to dismiss the mercurial behavior of teenage girls, saying, quote, it's just the hormones. But is it? In her new book, Untangled, Guiding Teenage Girls Through the Seven Transitions into Adulthood, psychotherapist Lisa Demour uses neuroscience to explain what's happening in the brain during this time of growth and transition. And Lisa Demour, the director of the Center for Research on Girls at the Laurel School in Shaker Heights, Ohio, joins us now. I know I'm Frenchifying your name up it's a lot. Because right. I know you're, you know, you're from the States, so you would say Lisa Demour. Probably. But I like the sound of Demour. And it sounds good the way you say Thank it. Thank you very yeah. much. Why the focus on girls and not boys? Let's start there. Well, largely because that's who I mostly see in my private practice. Uh, those are the girls I know the best. I also, as you mentioned, I run a research center on girls, okay. and I consult at a girls' school in my community. So girls, that's where I live. And you that's have two I'm girls. Coming. And I am the mother of two girls. How old are they? They are 5 and 12. How do you be a mother to those two girls and not be a psychotherapist to those two girls? It's a great question. This is a real occupational hazard of being a psychologist <laughs> parent. Mm -hmm. And actually, when I was pregnant with my oldest daughter, my, um, one of my really good colleagues said to me, so, do you want to hear how psychologists mess up their kids? <laughs> and I said, yes, actually, I would. It's got to be a thing. It is a thing. And she said, they talk about feelings way too much. And that, to me, rung right. You know, that the psychologist parent might say, oh, you're having a big mad feeling, when really they needed to say, I think you're going to be OK. And so that was actually great advice for me. And so I try to leave my hat at the door when I come home from work. Um, and I try to bring some of the better things about being a psychologist home. Like, I know what really bad looks like. And I know most of the time we're not even anywhere near there. So I think it makes me more relaxed as a parent. Your oldest kid, just from our conversation yeah. earlier, sounds very cool. <laughs> now, I'm going to invite you to use profanity on our airwaves here, <laughs> because I want you to tell this story. This is a great story about how hip okay. your oldest daughter is. Well, so she is an incredibly well-behaved, terrific, you know, wonderful girl, and she gets along great at school with adults and kids. And we have a running joke when, um, when she comes home from school. I say, how was school? She goes, you know, kids are assholes. <laughs> and I say, yes, they can be. <laughs> and that's, that's our joke. And I think um, that's something funny that happens in our home, but it also gets at something I wish parents felt more comfortable doing, which is, you know, you can mess around with your kid, you can have fun, and also, you can get away from the idea that school is a happy romp of a bunch of children enjoying themselves mm -hmm. all day. Because Which is not quite true for everybody. Well, it's not true. And the reality of school is that school is 40 randomly selected children who are put in a class together and spend all day, every day together for a year. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in that that would tell us they would enjoy each other. <laughs> So I think sometimes parents become so dis, you know, so worried mm -hmm. when they hear their child saying, well, this kid's kind of bothering me, and I don't like this kid. And the parent thinks, what's wrong? And I think, why would they like all of these children? You know, <laughs> if they find a couple they really like, they're probably in business. That's such a good point. Why, uh, it's funny that that view is sort of not more yeah. pervasive in society, because yeah. it makes abundant sense the way you say it. Well, thank you. So, <laughs> so I, that's a good example of where being a psychologist can be helpful at home. Hmm. My expectations for how much a group of children who have been randomly selected are going to enjoy each other are pretty low. You don't have boys, so I can't really ask you how would you raise boys and girls differently, but should we be raising boys and girls differently? You know, that's a great question. Of course, I think the answer is no. I think that the socialization is so automatic, you know, mm -hmm. that as a culture, we look at girls differently than we look at boys, and then when boys get together, they act differently than when girls get together. So I think as parents, we raise the kids we've got, and we raise them as the people they are. I think we probably are working against broader forces that are socializing our children, regardless of what we do. There is wiring there that goes back billions of years, isn't there? There is. You know, and there's some stuff that's wired, and there's some stuff that is actually um, not that different at the point of birth, but that we cultivate into hmm. gender differences over time. Gotcha. I want to read an excerpt from your book. Here we go. This is from Untangled. When I was in my first semester of graduate school, the professor teaching my psychological testing course handed me a stack of Rorschach inkblot tests to score. Before sending me on my way, he offhandedly said, double check the age of the person whose test you are scoring. If it's a teenager, but you think it's a grown up, you'll conclude that you have a psychotic adult, but that's just a normal teenager. This is a great point, because let's get into some understanding of what is happening to teenage girls, where if they were adults, we would think that they were psychotics. But since they're not adults, we just think it's normal behavior. Typical adolescence. Yeah. yeah. What is that about? 
You know, a lot of it has to do with how emotion operates in teenagers. And what we know is that emotions run very, very high in teenagers, and they run hot and cold, and they feel very out of control, often for the parents. And what we can also forget is it feels out of control for the girl, too. Hmm. Um, the girls are often quite caught off guard by the strength of their feelings. And um, we can sometimes, I think, be dismissive of something that's pretty hard on the girl because we just don't know what to do with it hmm. as parents. But that kind of what we call affective lability is sort of the technical term, but it's basically all over the map feelings. That looks like psychosis in adults, but it's typical in teenagers. Has it presented itself yet in your 12-year-old? You know, she's a pretty steady um, girl right now. So you might get off easy. Well, or we'll just see how time <laughs> see unfolds. How yeah, yeah. <laughs> to help make sense of it all, you outlined seven stages of development. And uh, Sheldon, I'll just ask you to bring this graphic up so we can see the seven transitions. There is number one, parting with childhood. Number two, joining a new tribe. Number three, harnessing emotions. Number four, contending with adult authority. Number five, planning for the future. Number six, entering the romantic world. Heaven forfend. And number seven, <laughs> caring for herself. Let's break this down a bit. Leaving childhood, you often hear parents fret about the fact that their kids are growing up, growing up too quickly. But how do you deal with the opposite side of the coin, which is kids who want to be Peter Pan forever? You know, it happens where kids really tuck into family life and seem to be very wary of anything that seems grown up. I think that for a while we can just let that ride and see if it doesn't solve itself. A lot of problems with kids or things that look like problems go away if we don't do anything. So I think my first advice would be do nothing and see what happens. But I think if you've got a 16 or a 17 or an 18 year old who really wants to be home more than she wants to be with friends, is telling her parents everything. You know, that's always interesting to me when I get a girl in my practice and she's 17 and she says, oh, I tell my mom everything. I think. That's, really? That's odd, eh? That's, Why? Hmm. Yeah, what's that about? And sometimes it's that the parent's very fragile and the girl is still home sort of staying connected and taking care of a parent who can't tolerate being left. Um, sometimes it's that, you know, there's something else that's made the girl very, very anxious. And so the idea of getting out into the adolescent world is too scary. Hmm. But I think if we still have girls who seem very, very childlike at 16, 17, 18, I would start to wonder what's happening there. Some of it, though, I gather, I, I think I remember this correctly from the book, is where maybe mom is in distress or is having a real tough time and daughter has to play the role of savior. I've seen that. Yeah. Or, you know, maybe a really poor marriage where mm -hmm. the daughter serves as the confidant to the mother. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I understand where that mom's coming from. And I can imagine, you know, there's some real joy for both people in that close relationship. But it's not the grounds for the separation that teenagers require and that they need to make so that they can go out on their own. So ultimately, unhealthy. Understandable, ultimately, but unhealthy. Ultimately, something is getting sacrificed in the girl that should not be sacrificed. When it comes to the new tribe, I'm going to say something here that you've heard a thousand times and that we've all heard <laughs> a thousand times. If your friend jumped off the Empire State Building, <laughs> would you jump off the Empire State Building? Why do teenagers want to imitate what their friends do, even if their better judgment tells them, and it's screaming in their ears and they know it, yeah. it's not a smart thing to do? Yeah, no, it's um, what we know about the adolescent brain is that the wish to be connected and the rewards, the, the brain has a reward system, and the rewards that get triggered in the brain when you are connected to your friends actually outmatch their better judgment. How does that make sense? <laughs> well, no, it doesn't. And, and this, this gets to, um, there's a great term called neurological gawkiness in adolescence, where their brains are a little bit, you know, out of sync at times. And I think one of the things that's really striking is that when we do research on teenagers' assessment of risk, if you have your teenager in your kitchen and you're saying, okay, well, is it a good idea for you and your friends to, you know, go to a party and drink a lot? They will say, oh, no, no, it's a really bad idea. And they know that. And intellectually. Intellectually, and they believe that in mm -hmm. the kitchen. When they get to the party and everybody's drinking, the party and the other kids overrides what they know. So there's a big gap between what kids mm -hmm. will say in the you know, cold light of day at home and what they'll do in the hot light of a party. And that's scary. So I think, what do you parents. do as a parent then? Because it, 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 nowadays, those parties don't start when the party happens. Nowadays, you know, they pre-drink, yes. right? At yes. home before they go to the party. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. what they call it. Pre-gaming. Yeah so that you don't have to spend so much money on booze when you actually yes, get to the party. Yes, yeah. You come half in the tank. Yeah. What do we do about that? 
You know, it, that's the scariest part of being a parent of a teenager. You know, at some level, we cannot guarantee that our teenagers are gonna make good choices and keep themselves safe. Mm -hmm. And there's really nothing we can do that will solve that for good. And, no and one that, wants to hear that. I know, Lisa, no I know. No one wants to hear no there's nothing to, we can do. But there are some things we can try. Okay. So I think that the first thing I would recommend is to always talk with teenagers from the framework of their responsibility to take care of themselves. So when you're talking about parties, I don't think it's helpful to say, don't let me catch you drinking. Because for most teenagers, what they hear is, don't get caught drinking, <laughs> right? So I think yeah. a better way to frame it is, look, you and I both know there may be drinking at this party. I love you. I think you love you. What are you going to do to make sure you're safe? Right? That the burden goes with the teenager to the party. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, again, does not guarantee that your teenager is going to get there and be the most reasonable person in the room, but at least points everything in the right direction. And at some level, I think you have to know your teenager. And if they are wild and highly impulsive, they probably shouldn't be going to so many parties. And if they're a pretty straight shooter and they've got pretty reasonable friends, you can probably give them a longer leash. Try, try telling your 16-year-old daughter, I'm worried about you. I'm worried you're out of control. I'm worried you're going to make bad decisions. You can't go to this party. What happens then? You know, that tends not to go over very well. <laughs> no kidding. I think a better way to approach that is to say, look, last weekend you said you would come home at this hour and you didn't, so that makes me question your judgment. You need good judgment if you're going to go to these parties. What kind of parent am I if I know you've got bad judgment and I send you out into the world? So let's do this. You show me good judgment for a month, we'll reconsider this party. So it's often easier with teenagers. I mean, none of it's easy, mm -hmm. but it's often e easier to say instead of no, you can say yes when. Yes, we will talk about that party when you are coming home, when you say you'll come home, when you text me, when you say you'll text me, when you pick up the phone, when I call, whatever the when is that can reassure the parents. I think often to articulate the yes when is better than the flat no. Mm -hmm. I think the thing we also forget is that kids actually want boundaries and they actually want to win and earn your respect. And we forget yes. that because we're so terrified of saying no to our children, right? I think that's right. And it's interesting. I'll, um, I've had this exchange in my private practice over the years where a teenager will say to me, oh, you know, we were at Jenny's house and her mom was buying beer for us. What? I know. <laughs> I, I, well, I try not to say that, right, because that's very tempting. And I say, she was. Is that cool or is it kind of weird? And the teenager says, it's weird. Yeah, they get it. They really yeah. dislike it. They like the grown-ups to act like grown-ups so that they can be the ones who act like teenagers and mm -hmm. they can feel safe. Mm -hmm. You give a good piece of advice in this book on how kids can blame you if they want to avoid the peer pressure. Yes. Give that yes. example. So I think it's really unrealistic to send a teenager to a party thinking they're going to say to their friends, guys, you know, we're not of legal drinking age and I don't feel that that's safe. That's just not how teenagers operate. Right. So my, my advice is let them blame their good behavior on you and be their partner in that. So I think we should say to teenagers, look, if you get to a party and there's drinking, if you want to tell them that I will breathalyze you in your sleep because I'm crazy, go right ahead. <laughs> and if anybody stops me in the grocery store and asks, I will cop to that. <laughs> because what we can do is give teenagers a way to still be cool while saying no. Look, guys, I would love to drink. My dad's nuts, right? So I can't. That's a more realistic option for a teenager saying no than, thanks so much, but you know, I. I I'm going to decline because it's not legal, right? That's not how teenagers operate. What explains in teenagers, particularly girls, I guess, the sudden rudeness? <laughs> so they get pretty snarky sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, one way to think about it is they're often awesome everywhere else. You know, I think a lot of parents feel that their daughter barely talks to them and she's incredibly rude. And then the neighbor says, oh, I saw your daughter the other day. She is darling and she's so charming. We had this great yeah. conversation. And the parent's thinking, my kid? Are you talking about my kid? <laughs> Um, I think that if we imagine, say, a school day, right? So you've got the 40 kids you didn't choose, and you spend all day with them in a classroom, and then you've got the five adults you did not choose who are telling you what to do all day in subjects that you did not choose. Um, it's a long day for kids. And then they're around all of these other pretty emotional teenagers. Mm. And my experience is that kids are amazing at school. They are really patient. They are really decent. They put up with a lot of nonsense without saying anything. Mm. And what we know is that willpower is a limited resource, and most kids are darling and charming all day long, and they come home and they're done being nice, <laughs> right? And so there's a limit. There's a limit, and so the parents, unfortunately, and sometimes the little siblings, often, mm -hmm. are on the receiving end of the punishment for that teenager's bad day. Now they say, oh my God, it's just the hormones talking. Now you're not buying that, right? Well, the science doesn't really support yeah. that. Um, 
you know, the hormones are not completely out of the question, but we have a way to measure hormones in a moment-to-moment -moment way, and it doesn't line up with the emotions. And what we know from the science is that it's probably more about what's happening in the relationship with the parent in that moment or other factors, mm -hmm. or it's neurological development that's underway. Mm -hmm. um, we know a lot more about the teenage brain, and what we know is it upgrades throughout adolescence, and the upgrade happens in the order in which the brain developed. So the lower centers, which are in the back of the brain and include the emotions, upgrade before the upper centers, which are in the front of the brain, which includes the controls. Explains everything. It does, actually. <laughs> so you've got these poor teenagers who have these highly, highly effective emotion centers that have strong reactions that totally outmatch these lesser, still coming online controls. Mm -hmm. So things get pretty, pretty hot pretty fast. I want to play you a clip, or I'll ask our director, Sheldon Osman, actually to roll this. This is Frank Lawless, who was on this program, psychologist, uh, eight years ago or so. And uh, we talked about many of these kinds of things around adolescence. Play the clip, we'll come back and chat. Shelton, if you would. What happens in childhood is that you have a sprouting of the neuro firing, the neuro connections that go on in the brain. When it hits that adolescent time, it begins to prune. And it, in order to prune, it has that kind of specialization uh, aspect to it. So during this time, what the adolescent is, is trying to do with, from a brain point of view is try to find the strengths and, and the empowerment uh, that is uniquely his or hers. We, and what happens as a result of that for uh, up until at least 25, but certainly during the first two years, is there, is that there is a certain lack of judgment that goes on and certainly a lack of uh, ability to uh, foresee future consequences, especially okay. in terms of implications. So continue that thread along. Sure. What eventually leads to better judgment? Well, what we say is that by about age 24, the frontal cortex is fully online. 24. Yeah, so that's kind of late. Um, mm -hmm. and, and probably a little earlier for girls than for boys because girls go through puberty earlier, so some of this is advanced for them. But the thing I think that we need to be mindful of is Teenagers have great judgment in what we call cold situations. When we ask them when they're not around their friends, when they're not under time pressure, when there's not a lot going on, they actually know what's right and wrong. And they actually tend to overestimate risk. They actually hmm. think things are more dangerous than they really are. What's interesting is what we call hot situations. When they get with their friends, that judgment then is unstable. So it's not that they don't know right from wrong or can't make those kinds of judgments. I mean, we have 17-year-olds writing brilliant analytic papers. I mean, they've got good minds. The question is, when is that good mind not easily susceptible to peer influence? And that seems to take quite a bit longer to come on. Would you say it's part of a parent's responsibility then to ensure that their child finds him or herself in more cold than hot situations? Well, to the degree that we can, yes, it helps. I think also it's good to know who your kid's friends are, right? Because, um, you know, if your kid surrounds herself with some pretty reasonable kids, situations are going to stay colder, which is how we like them. Mm -hmm. You know, if your kid is drawn to the, you know, the wild children, that's a lot of hot. And, <laughs> and I think that's a good grounds for being more careful. When our kids stop liking us, quote unquote, the way they did when they were little, mm -hmm. what is the best way to handle that? I think number one, don't take it personally. Right, it feels so personal. How do you not take it personally? I know, well, the joke I make is it's like your kid broke up with you, you know, <laughs> and I think, I think it feels that way. You know, we used to cuddle, we used to talk, and now you will barely acknowledge me and definitely not acknowledge me in public, right, which feels really bad. Um, one way I've started to think about it is I think it's hard um, to go from the childhood relationship kids had into the next new nice relationship without anything in between. Um, the analogy that in some ways does apply is, you know, you can maybe have a friendship with somebody you used to date, but you probably can't have that friendship the day after you break up, mm -hmm. right? Probably two years later. Mm -hmm. So I think in some ways, the times when our kids are avoiding us, it's those intervening years where they're trying to figure out, we used to have this particular romance, we're gonna have a different relationship over time, but right now I need to pretend like I don't know you. <laughs> That's very funny. As a parent, do you have a rule of thumb? I shouldn't say as a parent, as a parent or and or as a professional. Mm -hmm. Do you have a rule uh, of thumb as to when you intervene in your child's life and when you step back and say to yourself, you resolve this, you figure this out? Um, I would say 90% of the time, the rule should be back away. Back off. Back away. Oh. Um, I think, you know, most problems either solve themselves or the kid solves them, hmm. right? And I think it, we need to make room for a kid to solve things. 
I think very rarely is there anything we should step in on that has been going on for less than 24 hours. <laughs> you know, I think that's so the, the first general rule I would make is, you know, unless somebody is bleeding, right, or there's something really scary going on, I would say let's give this 24 hours and see where we are. Um, a lot of times what feels like a crisis to a teenager at, you know, 6 o'clock on Saturday is not a crisis by 6 o'clock on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's better if the parent can hold off. Um, but it's hard to tell. And I think sometimes parents have too much data now because of, you know, we talk about kids and their social media, which is its own special topic. Yeah. Parents are now aware of a whole lot more about teenagers' lives than your parents and my parents knew about our lives. For sure. Um, I think about how my friends and I acted in the locker room at swimming and the way we talked to each other and the way we joked around, which was really irreverent. And I think if my mother had a record of that, I would be in jail. You know? and so I <laughs> well, think she wouldn't recognize she you, wouldn't, first of all, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. And so I think sometimes it's best if we're in touch with our own adolescence and how irreverent we were and how silly we were and how many crises we had that our parents never knew about. And to try to think, okay, did I handle this? Did time pass and this went away with my mother or father never even knowing? You know, and if that's a possibility, I think we should be careful. If it's a crisis, it's going to last. Mm. You know, a crisis will go past 24 hours. And then you'll have time to deal and with it. And then you'll know it's a crisis, you know. But I think mm. unless it's very frightening, I would, I'd be careful. Robert Coloroso always used to say, if it's not life-threatening, it's not health-threatening, let them do it. I, Does that make sense? How else are they going to learn to manage themselves? Yeah. Right? We want to yeah. turn out teenagers who can actually leave our homes. <laughs> they have that's right. to make mistakes. That is the, that is the point, right, yes. of parenthood? You have to yeah. develop a child who eventually will be independent. Right, and who has judgment, and sometimes yeah. we get judgment by messing up. Right. If they're constantly negative, what do you do about that? It's a tough one. I think if they're constantly negative at home and positive everywhere else, it's probably normal development. What I don't like to see are teens who are negative everywhere they go. Mm -hmm. um, and I think often that is a sign of depression in teenagers. And I think one of the things I wish people knew more about, and I'm delighted to talk about, is that depression in teenagers does not usually look like depression in adults. In adults, it's depression as we imagine it, sort of that mopey sadness, the kind of the blues feeling. Um, in teenagers, it usually looks like irritability and crankiness that is chronic. It goes with them everywhere they go. It goes to school. It goes to the neighbor's house. And um, it's easy, I think, for parents to roll that in with a negative stereotype about teenagers, mm -hmm. but it's actually not typical. So it's much more typical to have a teenager who's fabulous at school, fabulous over at the neighbor's house, and then comes home and is a little bit snarky, or maybe chronically snarky at home. Mm. Highly unusual to have a teenager who is snarky all the time everywhere, and definitely grounds for concern. So barking back isn't going to help professional attention, maybe? Yeah, absolutely. Or empathy, empathy. right? I mean, empathy. I think it's, it's hard to remember that's probably a teenager who's suffering. Uh, tons of data these days about how important it is to eat together as a family, right? And how yeah. that is a, a yeah. you know, superb way to stay in touch with your kids and, of course, forge better relationships. Is there an even better place than the dinner table for that to happen? You know, it can happen in lots of places. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I think we don't talk about enough is this idea that the highest functioning kids come out of families that have a lot of warmth and a lot of structure. This is a well-established, mm -hmm. kind of old finding in our field, but a really valuable one. So I think there's lots of ways to get warmth and structure. You can get it by having meals together. You can get it by going to baseball games every Saturday together. Mm -hmm. You can get it by, you know, everybody does this, you know, goofy volunteer project together every weekend. What I like to see is that teens are held to some expectation that they join the family for something, mm -hmm. even if they join it not in the world's best mood. And I like to see parents who actually go out of their way to make it happen. This seems to me to be the ingredients of, you know, coming to adults that we really like, you know, turning out grown-ups that we're going to feel really good about. Um, that doesn't mean it's fun for everybody at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I think a lot of parents think, why am I doing this? You know, why are we insisting that you sit at dinner when you, you know, give us one-word answers and make us feel like you're doing us a favor? But I, I would encourage parents to do those things or volunteer projects or baseball mm -hmm. games. There's something about saying you need to be with us and we want to be with you that I think is fundamentally really powerful for adolescents. And pays off eventually. Oh, absolutely pays off. Yeah. I'll tell you the flip. I have teenagers in my practice who talk about families that are so disorganized that nobody ever has dinner together. There's really no food in the house. There's no organized mm -hmm. plan. And this to them, they feel the injury in it. They sort of feel like, don't you want to spend time with me? Hmm. Don't you want to make a way for us to be together? And I can promise you, if the parent insisted on it, that teenager would show up all snarky at the meal. But they are well aware of when the parents are not creating that structure and asking the student to be, or the, the teenager to be part of it. Mm -hmm. This great advice in, and more 
in Untangled, guiding teenage girls through the seven transitions into adulthood. I mean, somebody whose last name is Love, <laughs> you have to listen to, right? Lisa Damour, or Damour, yeah. however you like it. Uh, thanks so much for visiting us here at TVO tonight. It's a pleasure to meet you. Likewise. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.